done. There we go. Okay, well, and to make sure that we get the most out of our hour or so, and to keep to time, I'm going to start our ninth, can you believe that, ninth Choice Cuts um, evening event. And this evening we are talking about, um, quite, so it's a massive topic, um, but the ethics of eating meat, and is it morally right to eat meat? And thank you once again to Jude, um, who's the ABP Chair of Sustainable Beef and Sheep Production at Harper Adams, and uh, an independent consultant as well um, for, for penning this article, on the way to Brazil, no less. So um, I'm sure when you were thinking that as you were flying along, um, some of the uh, some of the uh, the sort of the culture clashes you you get with going to going to Brazil, one of the largest beef producing nations in the world, and then talk and meat consumers in the world, and uh, writing this paper, but but really interesting. Um, so the usual form is that uh, Jude has actually got some slides, and we'll do a brief uh, summary of uh, the paper, and then we'll dive right into the discussions. As usual, we have the chat function available. Uh, to, to drop questions in, which I'll be keeping an eye on, and also um, when when the opportunity arises, once Jude's finished uh, discussing the paper, to, to jump right in and put your hand up, virtual hands please, if at all possible, um, or if not, put your camera on and wave at me frantically, and we will come to the questions in turn. Uh, as uh, Jeff mentioned at the start, we are recording the session, so all of you will be able to go back and review that, or anyone who wasn't able to join us in the end. So we're really Grateful to have uh, actually 20 people, including ourselves, here today. So thank you to, to people from the livery, for people from the Institute of Meat, um, Young Butchers, the Master as well, um, all here today, and uh, some Harper Adams colleagues too. So thank you for all joining in on, on this discussion, and um, I hope it's going to be a really interesting one. I think that's all the housekeeping I usually do, so I'm going to hand straight over to Jude. Awesome. Thanks very much, Claire. Uh, pleasure to be talking to you as ever um, on what seems like the hottest day ever, it seems, but uh, perhaps that's just me at the moment. It seems really warm out there. Um, so almost into barbecue season, in fact. So it seemed like an opportune time to be uh, talking on this particular topic. And yes, as Claire says, I was uh, lucky enough to be in Brazil last week. So it did feel very strange writing this um, in a culture where at the hotel that I was at, there was there was so much meat. It was, you know, amazing, frankly. Um, so yeah, and, and a bit of a difficult one, if I'm honest, because as a uh, Many of you know I'm very sort of evidence driven. I like to have a citation for everything that I ever put down. I like to have a peer reviewed paper that I can ref um, refer back to. And yet this one's on sort of ethics and morals. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because that's to some degree entirely driven by personal preference and beliefs and culture and system. And, you know, all of these things which are not necessarily based on logic and science and where I can talk to people for hours as you know with a powerpoint and some data and some slides and some stats um, but that's not necessarily gonna affect what people feel and their gut beliefs and their thoughts about is this okay should I be doing this is this right is this wrong and those of you who were at the uh, excellent city meets lecture last year or rather I suppose uh, 18 months ago now when it was Frederick Frederick um Leroy doing the lecture showed some really interesting slides um, just showing what um, meat has sort of um, done for us as, as a culture, as humanity. And I'm always struck when I go to the um, Ashmolean Museum in the centre of Oxford, they have some Egyptian mummies and the hieroglyphics there refer to cattle, refer to oxen, refer to milk and meat and eggs. So, I mean, this has been part of our culture for, you know, centuries and centuries, whether we're looking at the Bible, whether we're looking at hieroglyphics or modern day texts as well. But when people have these ethical concerns, they tend to relate to a couple of areas, primarily the rearing and killing of animals for food. And I have to admit, that's the one that I find most difficult to sort of argue against because I can give you data and numbers on carbon footprints and land use and best use of land and byproduct feeds and all the things that we've been talking about in the previous eight but when somebody says I don't agree with killing animals you know that's a really difficult one to sort of argue with on almost any level 
but we have seen this rise in flexitarianism. So I'm going to show you just a couple of slides. So this one came out, hopefully you can see this, it came out just before um, just before COVID started, in fact. It was a study by YouGov. Um, they asked various questions within a report that was entitled, Is the Future of Food Flexitarian? And there's a link um, to the report right at the bottom, but of course I'd be happy to circulate it as well if um, anyone would like to see a copy. But one of the questions they asked was, which, if any, of these best describes your usual eating habits? Now, I took out the people who didn't know, because it seemed a bit weird that people would not know what they usually tended to eat. You know, that seemed slightly odd. So if we take out those people, um, of, of the ones who were left, which is 94% of people, um, meat eaters and pescatarians, so people who eat fish but don't eat meat, um, comprise the vast majority, so 81%. Um, 3% were vegetarian, 1% vegan, which it does tie in with the numbers that we keep seeing. So even though um, um, people who are vegan are often, not always, but often quite vocal about those choices, you know, they are still as a proportion of the population in a, in a minority. But this flexitarian group, that's 15% of people who answered. And flexitarianism is a really interesting thing because it's defined as a conscious decision to cut meat consumption but there's no prohibition on it there's no set quantities so that could be one less piece of bacon per month or it could be only eating meat um, at, on a Sunday roast for example and everything in between but this rise of flexitarianism does imply that people are thinking more about what they eat and making those more sort of conscious choices and there's a lot of social science work to, to show that there's a sort of cognitive cognitive dissonance going on out there so people know that meat comes from animals you know they aren't stupid but when they see a steak in a plastic tray they they can sort of in their minds disassociate steak and meat and you know blood and killing etc from live animals so they love animals but they also love steak and in their minds they can justify that as it were so um the reason i say we have such a challenge this came from the same report is that guilt is a major major factor so in this instance they were people uh, asking people who were either uh, meat eaters or flexitarians but who were thinking of giving up meat um, whether they felt guilty when they ate meat and dairy products. And of the people who were already thinking, maybe I should give it up, maybe it's not good for me, you know, the animals, the planet, the culture, society, etc. two thirds of them felt guilty when they ate meat or dairy. And that compares to only 25% of the people in the general population. Now I say only 25%, frankly, as an industry, I think we're doing something wrong if one in four people feels guilty when they eat meat or dairy you know but still that guilt factor particularly for people who are thinking of giving up meat and dairy is really really strong and overcoming a guilt factor with some powerpoint slides and some numbers you know is really, really tricky because it's a feeling it's a belief it's that gut sort of i i shouldn't be doing this this is bad for people animals the planet whatever it might be so i'm going to stop sharing now um but just to go through in very brief summary, the main arguments, and there are, of course, as many arguments as there are almost people in the UK, but the main arguments against eating meat are that animals are sentient, i.e. they can feel, they can think, they're alive, and they have rights. And so if we end their life, that's the sort of ultimate harm we can do to them. The perception that if an animal is farmed, as opposed to to being in its sort of natural environment that 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 inevitably comes with some kind of harm whether it's animal welfare animal health behavioral whatever it might be and to the same degree meat production will inevitably in sort of quote marks cause environmental damage and potentially damage to human health and you know somewhat irritatingly of course you can find papers that will back up all of these perspectives that I've just said. But of course, you can also find peer-reviewed papers to back up all the other ones on the other side that, that I'm now talking about. So for example, the primary arguments for eating meat include cultural, cultural and historical 
a tradition. I mean, we've been doing it for, you know, centuries and centuries, and, and there's a lot of biochemical evidence that it was the consumption of meat and animal products in, in the first place that led us to have larger brains and to evolve into the very evolved people that we are now. Um, there's obviously, and again, those of you who saw the City Meats lecture this previous year, year with Alice Stanton will have heard an awful lot about the nutritional value of meat, both in terms of high quality protein, but of course, all of the micronutrients that are absolutely essential for health as well. We've talked previously on these um, webinars about the use of byproduct feeds and the best use of land where we can't grow other other um, food or fiber crops. In fact, if you look at my background, that's a um, cow calf operation in Montana, where on average they have about 25 acres of land per cow, not because cows eat so much grass, but just because it's really, really poor quality land. And so to have cattle on that land is the best use of it. And from an ecosystem services point of view, we have huge benefits in terms of soil quality, soil health, birds and butterflies and, and insects from having a grazing livestock. And if we think about it on a on a global basis, you know, obviously those of us on this web on on this um, webinar are very privileged to be in the position that we're in. Um, but on a global basis, there are billions of very 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 low income people in in very low income countries who are entirely reliant on livestock and primarily a grazing livestock for income, for fertilizer, for cultural status for the opportunity for children to go to school for health you know all of these benefits so I think we all always need to um, think about the sort of low and middle income and um, country implications as well so given all of that that I've thrown at you you know is it morally right to eat meat you know should we be doing these things I mean those of us as I say on the webinar aren't in a low-income country um you know is it okay that we should still eat meat when arguably we have alternatives if you go to tesco's now you know you can buy a plant-based you know almost everything so should we be doing it is it morally right well jude thank you um it's hard to know where to start isn't it really where where do you start with with that question and um, um i suppose my my first thoughts were actually around the question of who are we asking this question to? Are we asking it about ourselves? Are we asking it about society in the next 10 years in the global north? So assuming that the global north is generally countries that are, are have enough food for their needs. Are we talking about the global south? Are we talking about the world in general? That's that that was my first question. Who who are we talking about? Because there is such a spectrum here and, and that perhaps steers thinking on on those questions because if we just if we're just talking about ourselves then as you as you say we have a very, perhaps a different answer to to if we put ourselves into the shoes of others yeah absolutely and i think it's difficult isn't it because if you look in the popular press and i'm looking at the guardian particularly because that seems to particularly hate meat all the time um they will quote things like you know, the average person consumes X kilos of beef per year, but that average has everybody from Brazil to Nigeria. Um, I'm very, very low to, you know, massive quantities. So I think we almost need to partition it out into perhaps even just the North and the South, you know, as, as in countries and areas where we can to some degree have all the food that we ever want 24 seven, you know, we can all go down the road and get fish and chips or Chinese or Greek or apples or potatoes or whatever it is, you know, what should we be doing? And then following on from that, what should we be doing in the lower income countries, particularly those where, I mean, even now I, I have a tendency to show some data and I think Alice Stanton may have shown it as well, actually, um, looking at the proportion of children who are under 18 months of age who don't have milk, meat and eggs in their diet. And that's not necessarily because of cultural reasons. It's simply that, that it isn't available to them. And there's a lot of data that shows that if they don't have that, they have stunting, they have problems with development and um, problems with cognitive processes etc um but there's still that balance isn't there between eating 40 kilos of beef per year and eating only two ounces of beef 
per year, for example. And we've got to find that balance. And that balance, I think, will change based on based on the country, based on the culture, based on the resources. You know, is it more environmentally OK to import lamb from New Zealand than to produce it here, for example? As you say, it's, it's a massive question. I wish we'd got days to talk about. <laughs> I feel sometimes if we did that, we, 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 we'd end up questioning all of society and and sort of that moving on from that question is is that we talk about the historic value of it which is different for for us in the uk um to perhaps to to um countries in the global south like like nigeria um talk about the history of, of consuming meat and and i suppose that that then brings us on to the question is is does our future require us to to consume meat um and then then you sort of come to the societal aspects and say, well, pe do people want to consume meat? And, and perhaps people's purchasing habits would tell you that, yes, they do. So while ethics is a consideration, people's desires and wants and needs are, are, are just as important in, in those decisions. And that isn't necessarily going to um, outweigh uh, the, the ethical considerations that can sometimes feel a bit nebulous. I can see that I've got a couple of questions in the chat and I'm holding off on bills because I want to bring it in um, around ecosystem services. But Ralph's got his hand up, so I'm going to jump to Ralph. OK, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, I'm, I'm zooming in from Austria at the moment. Lovely. So, um, right. Uh, it, this is a discussion about ethics and that's one of my pet areas. And I just wanted to make the point that ethics is about, about values, really. It's about, um, you know, uh, recognizing what our moral values are. And if we go back to the, the, the early Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, et cetera, um, the, as far as they're concerned, ethics is about living a good life. You know, the question is how, it's a normative uh, topic. How should, how ought we to live a good life? Now, there are plenty of people who would, are saying that um, who advocate a meat-free diet as necessary to living a good life. But Jude, you've raised up an awful lot of the issues that I used to raise in my lectures, that there are people in the world who, who can't access an adequate diet without meat. And there are places in the world where the only thing you can grow successfully to, to, to provide human nutrition is, is meat animals. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, it depends very much on, on where you are and, and what your personal choices are. But g going on, ethics is also about maximizing the good and minimizing the harm. And if, if we're going to raise animals for meat consumption, and I'm a meat eater and I'm also very much involved with the cheese industry and a great cheese eater, um, I, I tend to think, well, OK, we, if we're going to pursue these as activities to provide human nutrition, we need to do them in such a way that minimizes the harm. And the question always arises, if we kill an animal uh, for meat consumption, what do we take away from the animal? Um, that it, it's, uh, again, something I used to debate in the class with students. The, you know, if, you, if you take a, a, a cow grazing in a field and, and then you, you slaughter it, what you take away from it is more days of doing the same thing. Um, if you kill a human being, you, you, you remove a lot of potential, a lot of possibilities, because we're, we are a different kind of biological organism. So the important thing, I think, is if you're going to, if you're going to grow animals for food, food consumption, that you, you maximise the welfare, you give them the best quality of life during their life. Another can, perspective as well, and this might sound a bit strange, but the... Uh, if you take a utility, utilitarian perspective, the greatest good for the greatest number. If we ceased to eat meat, the animals that we, we, we farm wouldn't exist. Now, the question is, is, is non-existence worse than short existence? So, you know, if a, if a dairy cow has a four or six year life, is that four or six year life preferable under good welfare conditions to not existing at all? Uh, and and in, in terms of creating the greatest happiness, the greatest number, existence is a source of happiness in a sense. It's an experience. You know, how many of us would rather we didn't exist? You know, we do exist. We have no choice about it. We're here. And, and that existence is something that allows for us as human beings under the right circumstances. It allows human flourishing. Uh, good welfare conditions and uh, will allow... 
uh, uh, can allow animals, even if it's a short life, to have a life with experience and, and, and a kind of flourishing. And today I actually passed a free range poultry unit in the Inn Valley, and it was quite interesting to, to see how it was working. Just observed it for a few minutes. And the chickens are out there in, in long grass and, and, and also veg, all sorts of vegetation. And they really seem to be flourishing in, in that moment. Uh, the other thing I would say that if we if we all go to a, a, a vegetarian diet, um, it's, not a, it's not that animals won't be harmed. We might not eat meat animals, but in order to grow crops, I haven't got a, I have lots of farming friends, and I don't know any of them who can grow crops without pest control. And there's pest control right from the field right the way through to post harvest. You know, rats and mice have to be have to be uh, killed. So it's it you know, are we being selective in a in a sense in which 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 animals are we trying to 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 um, uh, be concerned about? And it's the old thing, you know, where on the phylogenetic scale do we do we cut off our concern? Is 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 the life of a rat uh, less worthy than the life of a of of a, of a, of a cow? And therefore, we don't worry about poisoning rats and mice when they're getting in our grain store, but we do worry about the life of the cow. So it, it is a complicated issue. And it's just, like you, Jude, I could talk all day on this one, but the, these are important perspectives. And I, I think, um, you know, the, the, there's, I think actually it is, it is I, the meat industry itself, I think, it almost needs to, to address this in a more considered way maybe a committee to come up, up with a proper judgment on the matter because the other and just to finish uh, I, I have enormous concerns about the, the the loss of rainforest for meat production but also for things like um, palm oil production and 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 the the, the you know if we, when we produce palm oil for vegetarians to eat we are causing immense uh, loss of life uh, uh, um, uh, animal life in under those circumstances. Anyway, Claire, I think thanks for sharing this. I'll I'll shut up now. Well, that's good because it's basically um, post-it note bingo. I can probably cross off half of the points I was going to make or ask Jude about in the time that you've just spoken. So, so I'm I'm so grateful that, for that, Ralph. Because uh, not because it saves me less time talking, but it, uh, it does mean that other people get a bit of a chance. But you've put it so well and, and captured how how all of those points link together that. Um, we're really so grateful but I will give Jude the right of reply um in, in case she hasn't she's got something <laughs> that I hadn't thought of which is entirely possible only a couple of tiny things and in the interest of um full disclosure Ralph was one of my uh lecturers at Harper Adams way back in the day so I have fond memories of HACCP and um <laughs> food systems um lectures and tutorials so yeah just um just a couple of points, because as I say, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, totally agree on the minimising harm. I found it very interesting when I've had uh, arguments on Twitter, for example, with activists who, for example, claim that animal welfare is so poor, therefore we shouldn't have livestock. And I say, but if we consider that we want livestock because of fertiliser income, you know, food, nutrition, etc., would it not make more sense rather than arguing against them to work for better welfare? But of course, most people don't want to do that. They just want to get rid of livestock. Um, completely agree um, on if we cease to eat meat, uh, then we won't have those animals in the first place. And again, anecdotally, when I've made this point to um, activist people on social media, they say, well, farmers force, force livestock to breed. And I go, well, artificial insemination, probably true. But what do you mean they force livestock to breed? Livestock only breed because farmers make them do so. And I'm like, have you never had a pair of rabbits that you thought were two girls or two boys? And like, one's a girl, one's a boy. Have you never seen cows in the new forest, for example? They breed because they want to. Um, believe me, you know, most of that has nothing to do with farmers. Um, but the other thing, and I don't think it's come up yet, I, I, I absolutely agree on the um, number of animals killed. Um, but of course, if we don't have animals, we do have an awful lot of pets. And cats, for example, are ob obligate carnivores. So how would we feed our huge dog and cat population, um, for example, if we didn't have byproducts from 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 the meat that we eat i know that there are vegan pet foods out there and i do have some queries about the nutritional 
value of that and frankly the environmental impacts of those as well um, but it isn't just us that benefits of course it is all of the pet animals and of course all the zoo animals as well but as I say I will uh, I will finish there and then uh, let, let other people have their have their chance. So uh, just to return on that then so is it really after what we're talking about around the ethics of meat is is our in our position guilt around um the things that we we feel we can't control in relation to um animal experiences and um decisions that we we feel uncomfortable with from an anthropomorphic putting human experiences into the the sort of the experiences of animals anthropomorphic point of view so do you feel that that's sort of societally the case because uh, it, was, it was only came up in conversation a couple of days ago when i was talking to a, a, a ghanaian friend who talked about meat consumption in Ghana and even though being Muslim it would be ideal to be able to consume halal meat he said none of nobody cares they just get what hold of whatever meat they can get because it's that important so do you feel that a lot of these ethical questions perhaps come up more because of um, the position we have around being able to have the time and space and uh, resources to be able to think about this or and do we, or do we have any sort of historical and perhaps cultural examples through religion. I'm just off the top of my head thinking about Buddhism, um, where these these uh, these ideas have been explored before and, and perhaps over history, there's there's been other solutions to perhaps the ones we're talking about now. That's a really good question. And, and I had a very similar conversation and I can't remember who it was with, but it was a lady who had come over um, from somewhere in Africa and she was interviewing me on my views on environmental impacts and meat and so on and so on and she said I did not know a single vegan or a single vegetarian before you know everybody ate meat meat was a sort of celebration um, well I guess and my knowledge of religion is only slightly less than my knowledge of particle physics i.e you know very 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 low but if we think about things like Lent um, that's entirely based on sort of giving up um, things like meat and eggs for a, um, a period of time. And in fact, the word carnival um, comes from the Latin, I think, carnival, meaning farewell to flesh. And so having those sort of um, periods of enforced abstinence as a cultural thing and then going, yes, he can eat eggs again. He can eat meat again. So it is it is sort of seen as a sort of celebratory food. I don't know many people, and this probably says more about my friends and my culture, who would say, let's have a really good meal tonight. We'll celebrate so-and-so's, you know, 30th birthday and we'll all have some brown rice. I mean, that doesn't appeal in a sort of festive way to many people. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's a really... I think it's a really good point because I think because we have the time and because we have the income and because we have the space just to choose and think and have the supply of meat that we do, um, I think that's what's led to an awful lot of these ethical questions. Whereas if it was just this is what I need to survive for my family to survive, you know, I'm going to get it. I think we would care much less, frankly. And, and I think as well, touching on that around the relative value of animals as well, Ralph picked up on that. And um, it was only it was a random conversation you get into when you're having your makeup done for your brother's wedding, when the makeup artist said she didn't really care about the welfare of chickens. She worried a bit about pigs and cows. So there is a relative value and, and that's a spectrum for people and their experiences. But she had no reason particularly um, that she disclosed in the 20 minutes that took to um, say why she didn't care about chickens. It's just that they didn't obviously resonate with her. and. So there is there is a spectrum there, but I'm going to um, ah Trevor is waving frantically. I'm so sorry, Trevor, and um, I'm glad you embraced the frantic waving because um, somebody noticed you, even though I didn't. So I'm going to come back to Trevor, and then I will pick up on the two areas which uh, I'd like to cover in relation to uh, reducing waste and um, sort of life cycle consumption and uh, ecosystem services, which Jude mentioned as well. So Trevor, over to you. Thank you. I I uh, just want to make some brief points. First of all, uh, farm animals have a far better life than wild animals. And, and if you watch the David Attenborough programme, you will see uh, awful things we might think as being awful. Um, 
often people say it's cruel to uh, uh, raise animals, um, transport animals, uh, slaughter animals. In fact, it can't be cruel because it is a financial uh, deficit if you if you're cruel to animals, you get bruising and so on. So there's there's a financial need not to be cruel. We mentioned uh, particularly uh, vegans uh, wanting to uh, uh, go back to plant plant based foods. I don't know if I've had heard of Chris Van Tulliken, but he's done. Uh, is he done experiments on himself and he's also done a lot of deep research. The first thing about plant based foods, uh, the number of additives that are put in them to make them palatable. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, everybody should have a copy of that. Um, plant, plant based foods, uh, first of all, to make them palatable, they have as many as 40 additives. That's the first thing. The additives, uh, many of them are uh, habit forming. Um, and they, they, they also are probably the single uh, cause of the obesity uh, that we've suddenly got in our children. So that, that can't be uh, re really defended. And if we reduce farm animals, we've got to replace what they would give us. So fewer farm animals, more plas plastic. I rest my case. Thanks, Trevor. I'll give Jude the, um, the right to reply. I, I had some musings on this as well, but go ahead, Jude. I'm just going to reply to one of the points, and, and and I think it was the first one that you made, in fact, which is I completely agree um, that from a financial point of view, it, it does, of course, make no sense to treat your animals poorly in any situation, whether you're pigs, poultry, you know, whatever it might be. Um, the problem is when we talk about that, to the consumer because you think that that made perfect sense right you know why would farmers do things to harm their livestock which also harm their income it can be easily turned around into so you only treat them well because it's an economic issue and I'm like no no that isn't it but that's how people will inevitably turn it around so I think you're absolutely right um that is absolutely true but but we've got to find a way to explain that to people so we don't say that we just in effect do it for the money um which is often how people hear it even if we're trying to explain it in a very you know common sense and um, scientific way thanks jude yeah, and, it, and it is really difficult even though you're trying to say this makes sound rational sense i suppose we're talking about things that are already not rational so people would yeah. people prefer to hear the arguments that well farmers care which of course they do but then then you look at the the negative um uh, examples and it's hard to overlook them i was just reminded when trevor was talking about farmed animals having a better life than wild animals and i was thinking back to the parts of the draft national food strategy um response where there were some suggestions that everybody should eat venison which would be very nice and and, and wild shot venison at that and i was thinking about the the arguments for well if you could eat game it, it's, it, it can have better welfare, which it, it can have better welfare, but, but with farming, at least we have the opportunity to, to make the animal's life better, whilst there are undoubtedly potential challenges in, in making it a life worth living. There is, there is an opportunity uh, and um, we know enough about animal behaviour and I know about enough about animal needs and it's an ever evolving um, area of research to be able to do that. And as, as Ralph saw, um, today or the other day when you were looking at those free range chickens. Um, we do understand that where the challenges come, of course, is, is in terms of cost of production. And, uh, and while some of the strategies in the UK talk very much about um, being a, wanting to, to move away from large scale production or to, to systems which have higher welfare, even in the UK, we have situations where large numbers of people don't have access to a a good diet or a healthy diet, which includes includes animal protein. So perhaps the question is, how can we improve the ethics of all farming systems rather than focusing on one to ensure that everybody has access to meat? Um, so 
I'm going to move back around to some of the questions to, around environments. I'll park one, which is around, is the easiest way to make food, eat, meat consumption more ethical is simply to waste less of it? And you could say that about all food. Yeah. If we ate more of what we produced and wasted less. So we'll come back to that one. But my one of my other thoughts, and it was coming back to Bill's question early, uh, early on, and while you while you reply to this, I'm going to go back up through the questions as well, is around why why are they keeping um, the land in Montana? Why are they keeping animals on the land in Montana? Is it poor because of previous agricultural systems or is it simply poor land? And then in which case, do can we expand a bit on those those the value of ecosystem services and perhaps actually that meat consumption is a byproduct of all the other activities and benefits that livestock provide can provide, not no, not that they necessarily do in all circumstances now, but can provide to, to our world. Yeah, absolutely. So the simple answer is no, um, there wasn't too much arable. It was just rubbish land. Um, there's an awful lot of mountains in Montana. It is it is incredibly beautiful. It's called the Big Sky Country for very good reasons. And, and many of the pictures that I use in my slides and for my Zoom backgrounds and things come from there because it was a it was a gorgeous place to live. It's very hot and very dry in the summer. It's very cold and wet but in terms of lots of snow in the winter so we'd have about four or five months of snow i've been in montana and had snow in in the middle of june in fact almost exactly today's date it was the 14th of june when i knew it um to snow in montana so a short growing season um the um, amount of water available um is directly related to the amount of snow that you get on on top of the mountains um and yeah just just really poor quality land and so therefore you know, lots and lots of poor quality grass. And if we assume that we want food from that land, um, it is a fairly large state, then the best use of that land um, compared to sort of terraforming it and using huge amounts of irrigation and, you know, massive as amounts of fertilizers to try and improve it is simply to put cattle on it, which of course has been going on for centuries now. Um, when I left Montana about eight years ago or so now, um, there were 1.5 million people in the state and there were 3 million beef cows, uh, which I think is the ideal ratio if I'm absolutely honest. Um, but it does have real opportunities. And to be fair, in, in the States, they're only just starting to really look at them. But in terms of biodiversity, there's an awful lot of in interest in um, improving the land for for um, grouse and other, other um, birds that really flourish with grazing livestock. I should note that I'm talking about cattle primarily because there are really few sheep sheep are just not a thing in the states it just doesn't happen somehow so loads of cattle but not in combination with sheep as we have over here but we see improvements in terms of soil quality soil fertility soil structure um dung beetles for example are absolutely key in multiple ways but primarily for from taking the dung from the animals um improving the soil quality and the soil structure from it but also their larvae acting as food for birds that coexist with grazing livestock so you have this sort of synergism between the birds and the dung beetles and the cattle and the soil fertility and if you get it right and at the right stocking rate i.e i.e the the optimum number of number of cattle per hectare or per acre then it works beautifully of course if you get it wrong then it all goes a bit pear-shaped but Short answer, lots of benefits, but no, it isn't poor quality land because of too much arable. It was just poor quality in the first place, which is why it has been traditionally cattle land for centuries. And before that, of course, um, bison, which HRH referred to in the city food lecture this year. She asked a question about bison and being a complete data nerd. I was like, I know the answer. I know the answer. So uh, just as a side note, the bison in... Um, North America prior to mass extinction in the in in the late 1800s um, had carbon emissions approximately double that of the 2007 US dairy industry. Um, and I can tell you that because I'm a massive data nerd and I once calculated it for a paper. Well, I think we all need that for pub quiz or at the very not uh, the very least <laughs> to, um, to when there's a lull in the conversation. Andrew, that's your next um, handbag. <laughs> notes as uh, margaret would call them just in case we're like well 
I'll tell you that. Um, so anyway, glossing over dung beetles, because otherwise I might go on about them and how I was most excited on my honeymoon to find one at the top of Peel Hill on the Isle of Man. Um, dung beetles are, are, are really important, they're a really good sign of ecosystems. Um, and I can see that Ralph's got his hand up as well. Um, so actually, and, and just again out of interest, um, areas of the UK would be in exactly the same position as Montana, Salisbury Plain, for example. There's a reason why there's Aberdeen Angus ranging over Salisbury Plain. It's because there's not a lot else there apart from tanks. And they do really well and, um, and, and using very similar systems. Um, but uh, I want to, I'll, I'll press you for a bit more sort of, uh, of a considered answer on um, things like how how we can sort of perhaps capture the ethics because Ralph mentioned earlier we need to the meat industry basically thinks has to think about it in a different way rather than justifying the killing of the animal talking about that whole life life cycle picture um so I'll leave that one with you and come to Ralph's question and um then perhaps we can revisit that I just wanted Jude raises an important point about the soil in my retirement I've been reading a lot about uh, fungi and I learned that there are quite a few fungal species that pass through uh, the digestive systems of grazing animals and that those fungi are important to the mycorrhiza, to the development of good soil quality. And it's, it's caused me to ponder that the, in my lifetime I've seen farmed animals disappear from the fields of Britain. Uh, they, you know, cattle are no longer in the fields are going to sheds. And I've been wondering about the long term effects on on, of, of that on soil quality in terms of the depletion of, of, uh, of, of soil fungal organisms. And I wondered if anybody's actually looking at doing any research on that, looking at the problem or, wh or whether it is a problem. Oh, that's a, that's a really good link back to sort of that life cycle bit, Ralph. Thank you. So uh, Jude, over to you. I'm sure people are and probably um, colleagues at IGA for the, so the in, 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 Institute for um, Grass and Research up in North Wales or possibly um, Rothamsted Northwick down in the southwest. I am sure they will be doing stuff on that. I don't know whether they are or not, I have to admit, but I very much hope that somebody is and I'm equally sure that somebody is. Simon Jeffries actually at uh, Harper Adams um, does an awful lot both on soil quality, but working with entomologists as well. So I would hope that um, that that's included there. But yeah, I, I think that's, that's an absolutely excellent point because we tend to think about the sort of biodiversity that we can see, like the birds and the, and the butterflies and things we don't tend to um, think about the ones that we can't see because they're microscopic and where the greatest proportion of life actually exists is yeah. is in our soil and as Bill succinctly put it if there's no livestock what environmentally sustainable soil improvers are there yep. which is a very good point unless you start to go down the route of, route of insect farming and insect poo but mm -hmm. is that better than than a cow I would say no. We do have opportunities for green manures, so things like planting a cover crop and then applying that back into the soil. And of course, we've got um, leguminous plants, so peas and beans, etc., that will fix nitrogen, but they don't give us all of the other benefits as well. And, and as far as I understand it, dung beetles don't have a lot of use for peas and beans compared to um, compared to dung from um, dung from livestock. You'd have to have an awful lot of sort of wild rabbits and squirrels and mice, I should think, to uh, get the same amount of dung as you would from a single cow. So uh... that is quite an image. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go. Well, one more fun fact for you. Um, I, and I'm given to understand this part of the reason why there's so many flies in uh, Australia is because the dung beetles there are adapted to digesting kangaroo poo and not cow poo. Ooh. And um, the dung beetles actually consume the fly larvae. And without that, then they don't. So not the mix of mitosis went very well for the Australians, but there has been sort of considerations about how you get appropriate um, species of dung beetles for, for ruminant poo. Um, so moving on, because I can see this rapidly veering off topic, uh, I can see we've got Ian with his hand up and um, it'd be great if you can't turn your camera on, no worries Ian, but um, uh, please just shout out to Jim. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, can. we can, thank you. Good, uh, thank you. And thank you, Jude, it's been fascinating, but my concern is, the question under discussion was, is it morally right to eat meat? And we should be aiming to answer this with a yes or a no, but we seem to be deviating into many other 
uh, interesting areas, but not answering the question. Question is, is it morally right to eat meat? That has to be, it, it is or it isn't. There's, I can't see there's an, a middle uh, path here. Thank you for bringing us back down to ground, In, I agree. Perhaps we should do a very quick poll if you think it's morally right to put your hand and um, to put your hand up. If it's morally right to eat meat, either wave your hand frantically or put your put your little hand thing up. I can't remember how to do it, so I'm just going to wave my hand. But but of course, we are a bit of a biased subsample, aren't we? You know, I mean, I would hope that if, you know, half of us on on a webinar for the Worshipful Company Butchers said no, then uh, something was going wrong in recruitment or something somewhere because, you know, we'd obviously have some issues. So yeah, very good point, Ian, thank you. Um, and it is a difficult one because it's such a complex one, but yeah, ultimately there's a yes or a no, isn't that? Now, whether we'd have the same issue if I went down the road to the local supermarket or into private, I'm inclined to think that, that if I went to my daughter's school, it would be, a resounding yes. She's nine, and as I understand it, there's about two vegetarians in her class of 30, for example, no vegans that I know of. Um, and actually, anecdotally, I was on the plane back from Brazil last week, so not an unbiased sample, but I did look to see who got their meals first, which tends to be the people who have, you know, vegetarian, vegan, gluten-free, you know, kosher, etc. And and there was 330 people on the plane. Obviously, I could only see about 40 from where I was sitting with it without actually counting but I only saw two meals that weren't the regular meals so that does seem to imply that of the 40 or so people I could see the other 38 of them were either not eating didn't care or were happy with meat so they were agnostic or or were <laughs> confirmed meat eaters which which is good so I suppose then the question perhaps we we need to be answering for Ian and I will come to you in a second um Bob is how do we uh how do we reassure people that it is ethical to eat meat? Is it things like embracing the ish? Uh, it's, it's a term that's often used for sustainability, sort of personal sustainability choices. So how, how can we help people to, 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 to be reassured that they can make ethical choices without drastic changes to their life and, and be content that, that things are moving in a direction? How do we communicate that? Is, and, um, is that through labelling? Is it through existing labelling schemes like Red Tractor or does it need to be something which is more all encompassing such as um, the, 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 the labeling, mandatory labelling schemes the government is proposing? Is that going to make any meaningful difference if, if people aren't or aren't able to or aren't willing to um, make those, those conscious choices in which case does it fall to the, the, the food suppliers, the retailers and their supply chains to make those conscious decisions for them? And is it our role really to communicate and to say, don't worry, we've got a handle on this, things are heading in the right direction. I do feel sometimes it does start with, with the ish for everybody and just trying to not achieve the pinnacle of sustainability or ethics or anything. And as Ralph put it, the greatest good for the greatest number um, mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than perhaps the, uh, the, the binary, well, the, the, the 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 pinnacle of ethics as, as we see it in this world i think and i say that in this in almost every talk that i do but i think it's relevant in almost every talk that i do it comes back to the data and, and the information do we have enough information and data to be able to categorically say that we are better as a society for health for environment for soil for food supply etc cetera, etc cetera, with animals and with meat in our diet um, we don't do we have data to show the consequences if we don't have animals that provide meat for our diet you know if we took away all the cattle tomorrow what does happen to the land the dung beetles the you know ecosystem etc cetera, etc cetera. and then while I'm tempted to say yeah we just need a different red tractor or an extra label in the supermarket you know we know that most people go in and they're going to go I'm going to go and buy the shampoo in the blue bottle and these apples because I like them and those sausages because my daughter would eat them last week and and they don't look at the labels apart from when they're just like really casually browsing which I believe people do in supermarkets I just tend to run in and buy stuff and run out again um oh do you amazing well done Claire because I I don't have the time I just don't and 
I wish I did, but I just, you know, I just like rush in by, rush out again. I think it's got to be more, um, oh, I can't think of what the word is that I want, sort of more, uh, not persuasive, but more pervasive than that. But that's the word I want. So it isn't just the retails. It isn't just the labels. It is getting to the point where people just go, of course, it's good to eat meat, you know. Of course it is. That's fine. Now, there will always be people who say, no, of course it isn't. But if we can get people to that point where they automatically go, yes, it's fine. Yes, it's good. Yes, I feel confident in it. And so that means in the press, that means in education, that means all the way through everything. And the problem is, and I, I feel like I'm getting maybe a little bit off topic, possibly not, but we've got so much negative press particularly in in the garden and um, the guardian and the mail and so on so on which are always eating meat's going to kill you bacon's going to kill you you know cows are killing the planet etc cetera, etc cetera. we have a huge image um issue as an industry and overcoming that i think is a multi-pronged attack in almost every place where we talk about diet and food from government to education to hospitals to the press to everywhere um and that's huge. But as you say, if if we could get it so people felt confident and people felt good about their choices, we would be a heck of a lot closer to uh, to something good. And good about choices because guilt it sort of seems to be common currency for lots of things in this world, um, not just for for food consumption around lots of our choices in in life. Uh, Pamela is asking as well whether or not cul embracing cultivated beef proteins, for example, might might be part of that route. So it's not the solution for everybody, but it 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 exists as an ethical solution for some people, which is unlikely to ever take over the world or replace agriculture as we've discussed in previous meetings so do you think that um, being broad-minded as an agri-food sector and and recognizing innovations is a, is, is 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 a is a better way to approach it than being defensive about established and historic systems yeah i think so i think we probably have an image to a lot of people as as being quite traditional and quite close-minded and if we can say there's a place for everybody there's a food for everybody feel free to eat cultured meat I think you'll come back to steak if you you know once you've tasted it but feel free to try it you know I think embracing diversity is you know absolutely great my brother um told me last year that he'd been to a vegan market in Woking or Guildford or somewhere and it had this vegan hot dog and it was fabulous and and, and they'd bought them and they'd cooked them for lunch with bacon and cheese and eggs and I was like brilliant that's <laughs> dietary diversity isn't it you know and the more we sort of um fight against it the more that the opponents will say they're scared they don't want us in here because we're kind of sort of disrupt the market etc now in interestingly and very quickly in um veganuary this year so the month of January um this year the plant-based alternatives lost market share and there's been more than one company I can't remember the uh, meatless farm was the one that's most re most recently gone into receivership and sacked all of their staff as of yesterday I think so that meatless bubble seems to have burst and cultivated meat may take over but there's still a question about the economics and and the environmental impacts in fact yeah. um compared yeah. to you know meat meat and again i mean it comes back to dung beetles doesn't it you know everything comes back to poo i think that's a line in scrubs but that's showing <laughs> my age possibly but um i'm going to take you as the last question if that's all right because i'm mindful of time and uh, we need to give time for a bit of a wrap up and some comments from the master as well thank you um i uh, if, if i wanted to make a comment about the challenges for the meat industry and then then i had a, a question but very quickly um the <laughs> Trying to defend um, uh, an argument is much less easy than uh, um, putting over all the positive things. I just, as a matter of interest, I, I, I googled the question, why should we eat meat to see what, uh, uh, what would actually come up? And uh, surprise, surprise, uh, uh, Peter came up initially, the Vegan Society and two and three others. And uh, about the sixth item was um, 
the soil association saying yes you you, you should be eating organic meat and, and and that's part of the problem isn't it for the industry that um uh, being able to marshal our positive arguments anyway my question was um uh, on a slightly different tack uh, the government legislation i think came in uh, 2021 introducing um uh, animals as sentient beings and I, I i just wondered whether that has made a difference uh, um, i mean jude or ralph might have the answer to that i think it's made a better argument for the people who are against meat consumption because they can now point to it and say see this is proof that they're sentient um i even saw some graffiti which was the most scientific graffiti that i've ever seen on a bridge um in wallingford by the river thames which said research at, at bristol university has shown that fish can feel pain therefore we shouldn't eat them and i'm like that's that's very scientific for for you know a graffiti on a bridge um so i think it has made it more of a challenge for us i would question whether my mum for example would have any knowledge of that legislation of that change and whether it's changed her opinion so i think for some more informed activist type people it's been a bonus to them it it has made it more of an issue for us um but i but perhaps for the average person it's still well of course cats can understand things because my cat knows when i'm going to feed it but then i don't eat my cat and 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 i eat cows and i think it comes back to that um cog cognitive dis dissonance again where we care about our cats and dogs and we think they understand everything we say but we're okay to eat cattle because we don't you know see them before they go into the plastic package for example and just very quickly to come back to christine's and um, question about the cause of the guilt is it that they're causing the slaughter of the animal do they understand the process uh, or believe the animals feel pain generally speaking it seems to be the sort of slaughterhouse images that get put on social media um which are not filmed on a nice sunny day with good lighting and you know everything going well obviously it, they are filmed in the worst possible light ever and of course made to look as bad as they possibly can so i think it comes back to ralph's um, comment earlier about if we take away life and we inflict harm is that the biggest harm that we can ever do um and i think that's the concern that uh, people often have um, with the guilt factor and, and i think they have that with their own pets as well um it's it would you, you get various debates around um, should should you be with your your pet when they have to be put down, and some people aren't aren't capable of doing that. So it it is it is generally a, a difficulty of people facing it, and perhaps around society's discomfort in 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 our country at least with with death generally, uh, coupled with a lot of other things and general guilt. Uh, so well, there's lots of questions in here around sentience. I'm going to say I'm going to say something optimistic and say that having acknowledged sentience, does that mean that now we we have a, a basic framework for making decisions that that can answer some of those ethical questions. There is now an expectation, essentially, at a legal baseline that we recognise that sentience and then how what measures we apply can then potentially improve it. It might be seen as a, as, as, as a limitation, but um, now, now seeing who is on the sentience committee, I am hopeful that the people that are on it are, are people that are are thinking more holistically around uh, what is what is the greatest good for the greatest number, not necessarily they can all feel pain. And to, to um, the point here around um, insects and, and I'm not uh, plants have 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 uh, aversive reactions and insects too. But uh, I read in the paper and considered it with my own bees, despite the fact that the pain they inflict on me sometimes is that that they are sentient too. And so so it's it's a continually evolving question. But but I I see it as now reflecting on it as something positive um which which might underpin at least at a national level for us some of those those points i'm going to let ralph have a, a quick reply and i'm conscious we're now at time so um ralph uh, i'm going to hand over to you and then i'm going to cut yeah. oh and bill is bill waving or is bill wanting to comment sorry ralph sorry <coughs> sorry it's just that i had to go so okay, thank, right. you. thank you very much it's been bye great. bill um bye. back to you ralph and then i'll come yeah, to so I uh, have to I have to go in a moment. The hotel dinner is about to start, and I need to go oh, and eat some, eat some meat. Um, they just aren't sent. I'm glad you know the, the, 
discussion of sentence is important, but we also need to consider things like sapience and cognition and, and the capacity of animals to suffer, to experience suffering. It's not just physical suffering, it's also mental suffering. And, and this is an area that I think there needs to be a lot more research into. And, I, and this comes, takes us back to, to welfare. Um, and I just wanted to ask Judah, the, the, the cattle out there in the wilds of Wyoming, uh, one presumes that they, they sometimes experience suffering, physical and mental, uh, in a very natural way that is different from anything that, say, cattle kept in, in, in good conditions in the UK might experience. So it's, it's going to be, you know, it, it, it's, it's very, very much context dependent. And I think this is the problem. We're trying to wrap all this up in this whole issue of animal welfare and animal suffering up in one neat package. But actually, there's so many different contexts that we need to consider. And it's not just in, you know, it, 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 worldwide. Even in the UK, we have so many different contexts. So it's something maybe out to that we could talk about just over a cup of coffee sometime. Absolutely. And just very quickly to come back on that. Yes, absolutely agree. Many of you will remember, uh, I think it happened last year, but also a couple of years ago, uh, hundreds of cattle dying because there's a massive snowstorm. Um, obviously, we know the numbers for the ones that are farmed, but there will have also been many, many other animals that equally died because of a snowstorm. And, you know, I see all the fat pigeons that are in my garden. I don't see all the ones that died because of predators that the, the eggs went out of the nest, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I was just typing in the chat, we should note that sentience and the ability to feel pain does not mean that a cow understands that when she goes on a truck to the abattoir that she's going to the abattoir and that she's going to be killed and I would hope that in a well-run abattoir for example that cow knows nothing about it until the second that she's basically killed and you know in some ways that is a better life than for example and I can say this you know I've had a cancer twice and from a welfare point of view that's really rubbish and I would rather be a cow that would never know you know in some ways um but yeah there we are that's a bit of a downer for the end of it, isn't it? Sorry about that. Ralph's waving his hand. Is that a bye? Yeah, yeah I have to go now. Sorry about that. Okay, Thanks very bye -bye. much for a lovely evening. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you your now. dinner. I, I was just going to throw in before I hand over to um, Andrew. Uh, of course, we're talking about the ethics of meat consumption, yet we're contemplating killing quite large numbers of animals in um, Ireland and in the Netherlands to meet net zero um so so we have to be we i think we are right to call out double standards there as well around around some of those ethical conversations granted they're only going to be killed once but what are they being killed for and um it, to top that as well we're talking about what we might do in, in europe if we ever get foot and mouth disease god forbid and they've automatically steered away from the idea of vaccinating and culling because of some of those ethical challenges as well let alone capacity challenges so on that note i think we can safely say we feel that it's ethical to eat meat. We have challenges in communicating those ethics to uh, consumers. There are many different mechanisms. Perhaps some of the easiest ones we can talk about is reducing waste, making the best choices that a person can make as well, um, and, and, making, and making use of any labelling and also supporting any, any initiatives, be they industry facing or industry based or, or to legislative level that, that help to move towards ethics as well. And I'll hand over to Andrew now. Thank you, Claire, and um, thank you, Jude. And um, it's obviously the fact that we've run way over time. Um, that's a, an interesting topic of um, discussion, no doubt, one that we should perhaps come back to uh, again in the future. Um, uh, the question was, is it morally right to eat meat? And I think um, all of us here would, would say categorically, um, and I would be disappointed if we didn't, that it is morally right to eat meat. But obviously we need to be aware that different people in different sectors of the world and communities have different morals as well. And to put it all under one umbrella is very difficult. And we hear about the, the vegetarians and vegans stopping eating meat because of their, their guilt. Why are they guil feel guilty? Is it because of the animal welfare? Is it because of the environmental issues? Is it because of the health? All of those wrap into, into uh, uh, many different reasons why people feel guilty for eating meat. And we have to do a, a lot of work in terms of educating people into the, the, the benefits and the, the whys and the wherefores of eating meat. Um, anyway, 
I'm not going to go anymore because, like I said, we're massively over time. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much, Jude, for the time and effort that I know you both put into putting these events on. And I also need to thank you all for attending to what has been a really interesting evening. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to seeing you again all very soon. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, with that, and with me having stolen six minutes, seven minutes of your uh, extra of your evening, I will say that we are taking a summer break um, until the autumn, probably September, Bob. Is that right? Possibly October. Possibly October. TBC, um, where we will be back with, with more choice cuts um, when the evenings are dark and everybody isn't outside having a nice time. <laughs> so um, I hope you all have a lovely summer, everyone. Thank you once again to Jude. Um, thanks again to Bob for, for helping us to organise these as well and to, to coordinating the attendance and thanks to Jeff for running them. And with that, uh, we'll call it a day. Thank you. Goodbye all. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks everybody. Have a lovely summer.